these presentations have been rich. Thank you all. In uh, 2016, the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Canada voted to approve resolution number A140. Let me quote, and remember these words are written by drafters of a resolution who are Anglican, not Mennonite. <laughs> the Anglican Church of Canada is in the process of acknowledging and adapting to a new context, one characterized by a diminishment of resources, influence, and status. No longer holding a privileged place in a Canadian society, we exist as simply one religious option among others in a society that is increasingly embracing no religion at all. In contrast, Mennonites have often existed as a church on the margins, both historically and in contemporary Canadian context. Their conviction that conformity to Christ necessarily implies non-conformity to the world has over the centuries put them in conflict with wider society and other churches, sometimes resulting in persecution. The Mennonite tradition's particular commitment to peace, justice, and nonviolence frequently puts it at odds with the predominant culture, yet it remains a faithful and vibrant expression of the Christian faith, and some of us Mennonites are kind of amused by the accolades that we receive here. <laughs> As the Anglican Church of Canada enters a new stage of its life, we ask if there is something we can learn from our Mennonite sisters and brothers about living faithfully as disciples of Jesus on the margins of society, recognizing that, quote, to live old patterns in this new reality trifles with the truth of our circumstances. Adopting the open and humble stance, the receptive ecumenism methods demands would allow us to ask our Mennonite brothers and sisters that we may have to learn from them about being a church in exile. Maybe the next uh, image. Mennonites have been attempting to live out their Christian faith outside the privileged confines of Christendom for their entire 500-year history, and there are, are there gifts Anglican can receive from Mennonites as we learn to move beyond being a church of the empire or predominant power? The ecumenical gift exchange is mutual, and it would be for Mennonites to discern which gifts Anglicanism may have to offer their tradition. One possible area that has been mentioned by Mennonites is to explore what would be the rich liturgical and sacramental life characteristic of Anglican Christianity at a time when many Mennonites are seeking to reclaim a deeper understanding of these aspects of an ancient common Christian tradition. Thus far, uh, the resolution. <laughs> So Mennonites have been exporting people, you know, for a while to, ang to alliance churches. And of course, we know that the fastest Mennonite, fastest growing Mennonite churches in Winnipeg do not have the Mennonite label on it. And Jamie and others can attest to some of that uh, dynamic. And interestingly, however, you could say that how there's maybe some infiltration going on because one of the drafters of this very document was my student 10 years ago. It was very interesting to me that some of the movers and the shakers in the Anglican Church around this dialogue are either the products of some Mennonite educational institutions or children of mixed marriages uh, or married in and so forth. And these are all very valuable places by which we intersect. I'm going to digress to tell some part of my personal narrative. Next image. In that turbulent year, 1968, I was in junior high school. And I was tossing a rubber hardball against the concrete wall in front of our house, and a man approached with a car and spoke to me this way, Mennonite-san wa kochira desu ka? I happened to be living in Japan, J Japan at the time, and he asked me, is there a Mr. Mennonite who lives here? <laughs> now, my parents were among the wave of North American missionaries that got to Japan right after World War II. And at any rate, I had to ask my father, what is this thing called Mennonite? I knew we were some kind of Christian because we were obviously different from the activities going on in the Shinto shrine behind our house. And I learned my first uh, story about Anabaptism. So I've actually come to Mennonitism through Anabaptism, although some people do it in reverse order, but these are just parts of our personal stories. At any rate, my father mused a few years ago, maybe it was General Douglas MacArthur that called us. 
It was a moment of weakness. But it just so happens my, that my older brother is, is named after two military generals of the American army in, in the War of Korea. So much for being pure Anabaptist Mennonite in my heritage. So my first memories growing up are of being a foreigner, a gaijin, in a very odd place. And so I have had to live with some level of identity confusion as I've grown up, even though I know what my phenotype represents and have to come to terms with that. This is not to say that I'm unhappily Mennonite. I embrace my Mennonitism, but I have always had this interest in exploring sort of other dimensions of what could foster my own personal story or my broader identity. I have always been supremely enriched by the places where I have been invited to be part of, including now this most recent di dialogue that um, that was occurring, and one of the things you find is that sometimes we find a lot more common with people who don't share our ecclesial label than those with whom we share an ecclesial label. And uh, maybe the event today is even a small representation of that in some ways. Let me show you just a few images of some of the most decisive dialogue events that have shaped and have changed me. Uh, next image. I've always said that I didn't want my education to get, or my schooling to get in the way of my education. And these were my teachers uh, for four years when I was a visiting professor in the largest Protestant seminary in the Philippines, where I was placed through Mennonite Central Committee as a apparently or so-called Mennonite peace theologian in a largely reformed-oriented theological seminary which was known for its embrace of a liberation theology that, that allowed certain limited use of arms to change social patterns. And it was a very fascinating few years in which we actually had Nicodemus-type conversations late at night because it wasn't always easy to do so during the daytime. Next image. So monthly, I got to share coconut communion at the uh, church where I fellowshiped on the university campus. The high point of the liturgy is when the celebrant takes a big bolo knife and hacks open a dried coconut and the juice flows. This was supremely dramatic. Now, the unfortunate thing is my children were young at the time, and all of the young uh, children got to take the coconut meat and the coconut juice in their communion, and we had to unlearn that practice when we got back to Canada and joined Mennonite churches, which have a little more <laughs> limited ways in which the liturgy is practiced. Next image. Uh, I was invited to take part of a, in a Shia Islam or Muslim and Mennonite uh, Christian dialogue, and this took us uh, both to events at CMU and also to Kumaran, uh, next image or two. Um, and these were just sort of very fascinating, vibrant events, and then maybe the next image to go, yeah, keep going, got to skip through this fast, just gives you a... This one occurred two and a half years ago when I was happened to be at the right place at the right time and I was tagging along with my partner who spent a lot of time doing peace building work in southern Philippines, the island of Mindanao. This was the location of a dialogue that was a three-day affair between Filipino evangelicals and moral Muslims. And uh, flip the, the image or two, give you a list. So these were, apart from the foreigners that sort of just were invited in or waltzed in or something, were a bit voyeur into this experience. But these are evangelicals and Muslims. Even though culturally and phenotypically they don't look any different. But it was fascinating to be in on this conversation. Next image for a few days when we shared stories. Next image. Uh, next image. And the high point, or the dramatic point, was that after a caucus event, one side caucused with the other, and the Muslim caucus said, you know, the best way to peace in southern Philippines is if we share marriage partners. And the evangelicals were just aghast. Uh, not having had that recommended earlier as a way to promote <laughs> peace in the southern Philippines. Next image. Back to uh, dialoguing with uh, the Anglican uh, folks. Uh, so this was our first event in Waterloo. 
And what we did is we first just got acquainted with our personal stories, our own personal narratives, and then we shared narratives of our respective traditions and how to narrate a tradition is an interesting one. And one of the things you'll notice is that this image doesn't fully properly represent the, the diversities that our churches represent, but there were practical considerations that simply limited the, the look of it to some extent. We also narrated to each other the challenges that we were, we were facing in our different circumstances. And then we talked about what to do, how to, how to broaden the scope of this initial startup of a conversation, which is designed as ecumenical gift exchange as opposed to designed to work toward full communion. These are different forms of ecumenical. Okay, here's the next image. One of the very interesting points of conversation was over uh, the discussion on lex orandi, lex credenti. To translate, and I should have an Anglican person explain this because it's an ancient theological tradition from the fourth century, but it's especially claimed in the Anglican communion and literally it means the law of praying, the law of believing. And to translate it roughly says, in the beginning there was liturgy. Prior even to the creeds, and prior even to the canon of scripture. And it's a very interesting concept that allows one to reflect and even now remember the coconut communion image of what it means to do liturgy in that kind of differing kind of way. And it reminds me as a theologian that theology is not conversation about God, but it is secondary reflection on our primal language of faith. <laughs> 